ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو مهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان الاصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي مصطفى صلوات الرب وسلامه عليه وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله واهلها في النار ثم ما بعد حياكم الله والله يحافظكم وجزاكم الله خيرا وما الله سبحانه وتعالى bless this gathering to be a gathering which is based on benefit and where the malaika come together to see the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and witness for us and that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us and bless us with ikhlas wa thabat the topic of this lecture is called iman and how to increase our iman which is something relevant to all of us as muslims as we are all in need and all of us have sins and we have many sins as the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said kullu ibn adam khata wa khayran khata'ina tawabun the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that all the children of adam have sins and the best of those meaning those who have sinned are those who make toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i wanted to remind myself on my way coming to the masjid i was reminded by my sons and they reminded me of the importance of ikhlas lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala so before i get into the topic i just wanted to mention a very important hadith hadith azim which is relevant to us all and it is relevant to having a class and sincerity in all that we do because if we sit in this gathering with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely then that we will be rewarded for that and this is incredibly important for us all in order to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make all of our intentions solely for his solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. And in this hadith an Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qala sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul inna ma uh, inna al-awwal nas yuqda alayhi yawm al-qiyamah rajulun ustushhida fa'utiya bi فأتي بي فعرفه نعمه فعرفها قال فما عملت فيها قال قتلت فيك حتى استشهدت حتى استشهدت قال كذبت ولكنك قتلت لتقول هو شجاع فقد قيل ثم امر به فصحب على وجهه حتى الكي في النار so in the beginning of this hadith that was narrated on the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one of the first people on the day of judgment who will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a man who fought and was martyred in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will be asked so what did you do he said i i strove in the cause and and fought for your sake and i was killed for your sake and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to this man you lied but verily you did this so that the people would say that you were brave 
And then it was said about this man, ثُمَّ أُلْكِيَ فِي النَّارِ Then he was dragged on his face into the hellfire. And the second person who was mentioned in this hadith, وَرَجْلٌ تَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمِ وَعَلَّمَهُ وَقَرَى الْقُرْآنِ فَأُتِيَ بِي فَعَرَفُهُ النِّعَامُهُ فَعَرَفَهَا قَالَ فَمَا أُلْمَتُ فِيهَا قَالَ تَعَلَّمْتُ الْعِلْمِ وَعَلَّمْتُهُ قَالَ كَذَّابْتْ وَلَكِنَّكَ عَلَّمْتُ أو لكن لَكِنَّكَ تَعَلَّمْتْ لِتُكُولْ هُوَ عَالِمُونَ وَقَرَاتَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتُكُولْ هُوَ قَارِئُونَ فَقَدْ كِيلْ ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِهِ فَصُحِبَ لَوَجِهِ حَتُّ الْكِفِ النَّارِ So the second man that will be judged on the day of judgment is the one who comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, and he, they will ask, what did you do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, I sought the knowledge. I strive to seek knowledge. And I was a, a, a big shaykh or a big talib al-ilm. And, or the man who read the Qur'an, he memorized the Qur'an. And he taught the people the Qur'an. And it was said about him that he was a great reciter of the Qur'an. But he didn't act upon this, nor was his intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he will be dragged on his face into the hellfire. And then the third one was the man, Arajulun Wasa'ala Ali. Fa'atahu min asnaf al mal kullihi. Fu'utiya bi fa'arafuhu ni'amahu fa'arafaha. Qala fama amal tufiha. Qala. ما تربت من سبيل أن ينفق فيها إلا أنفقت فيها اللق قال كذابت ولكنك فعلت لتقول هو جواد فقد كيل ثم أمر به فصحب على وجهه ثم ألكي في النار So this last individual was the man who said he gave charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he had a lot of wealth so he spent it over here maybe he built masajid Maybe he built Marrakesh al-Sunnah, Marrakesh al-Ilm, places where the people could study the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu where they can memorize the Quran. He spent his wealth in all kind of different forms of charity, and it was said about him that he was a very generous person. And this is what he replied to Allah subhanahu wa taala when he was asked, "What did he do for him? What did he do for his sake?" So he said, "I spent." in every path that I could possibly find. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to him, what says, Kadhab, that you lied. That instead you did this so that the people would say that you were generous. And you, you were a spendthrift, or you were someone who spent your wealth uh, in, in many different ways of sadaqah and khair. So it was said about him, and he will be dragged into the hellfire. And the reason is, is because all of them they didn't have their intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I wanted to begin by reminding us the importance of even when we come to the salat, to make your sincere intention to come and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you are coming to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're coming to seek the knowledge for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing whatever you do related to Islam, that your intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Getting back to the topic, Al-Iman and how to increase Iman. The concept of Iman in Islam is not a complex concept. It's not a difficult concept. However, the various sects, the various groups, and the non-Muslim groups, even the Jews and the Christians and other people, they differ over the concept of Iman. You know, what is Iman? And Iman is mentioned all throughout the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in order for us to get a proper definition in accordance with Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul ﷺ. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّ وَجُوكُمْ كِبْلَ مَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ wa وَالْكِتَابِ وَالنَّبِيِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that it is not from piety that we you know, face 
the east or the west, meaning towards the Qibla, you know, in whichever direction we're praying in. This, it's not from papiety. The maqsud or the purpose of this is not just we fulfill those uh, motions or those, those things that we have to do, although those, that's a part of the salat. That's a condition for the salat. It's a, sh- a shart min shurut salat. It's a condition from the conditions of salat. But the purpose is not that. Walakin al bir man amina billah. So piety is believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's having correct belief in who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And the day of judgment. Yom al akhir. And to believe in the books and the prophets that were sent to all the nations as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولٍ إِنْ نِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا تَعْقُودٍ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and we sent to every nation a people, a messenger to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and turn away from the ta'qood Turn away from those things, those people, those idols, those things which are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a part of Iman. And this is one of the greatest pillars of Iman as we will momentarily uh, discuss. So Iman or faith, as I mentioned, is mentioned in many narrations of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as well. Along with Iman. As was mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel where Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and uh, it was related by Umar ibn al-Khattab and Umar radiallahu anhu aydhan qal baynama nahnu julusun inda rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam that tayyom ithala alayna rajlun shadidun biyad al-thiyabi shadidun suad al-shar la yura alayhi athar al-safar wa la ya'rafa minna ahad حتى جلس للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبتيه إلى ركبتيه ووضع كافي على فاخذيه وقال يا محمد أخبرني عن الإسلام. So in this hadith, the angel Jibril came in the form of maybe a desert uh, Bedouin. He came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the, the Sahaba, and he was wearing a beautiful white thobe, and his hair was ex- exceedingly black, and he put his his knees up against the knees of the Prophet ﷺ in his hands uh, on the Prophet ﷺ's knees or it may have been on his own knees and he said O oh Muhammad he addressed the Prophet ﷺ as, as Muhammad O oh Muhammad akhbirni on Islam tell me about Islam the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying Al-Islam in tashhada in tashhada in la ilaha illallah وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَتُتِيُّ الزَّكَاءِ وَتَصَوْمَ رَمَضَانِ وَتَحَجِّ الْبَيْتِ إِنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلٌ قَالَ صَدَقْتَ فَأَجَبْنَا لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ وَيَصَدَّقُهُ So, in the next part of the hadith, after the angel Jibreel asked the Prophet وسلم, about Islam, he asked him, you know, what is Islam? He said, Islam is to bear witness that there is only one God worthy of worship, and that Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger. And that we should establish the salat, and we should pay the zakat, and we should fast the month of Ramadan, and we should, <clears throat> and we should try to make the sacred pilgrimage, the Hajj, if we're able to do so. And what was strange to the companions is that the angel, the angel Jibril said, "You've spoken rightly." So the companions said, "How did this person know? How did he ask the question and know the answer and say that he had spoken rightly?" So the second thing, which is the shahid and which is the main purpose of mentioning this hadith, is that the angel Jibreel mentioned, or then asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said, فَاخْبِرْنِي أَنَ iman And tell me about iman. So then the Prophet defined iman for us. He defined the iman in accordance with the sharia, one of the, the more specific meanings of iman. He said, al-iman... He said, "In tu'mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa yawm al-akhir, wa tu'mina bi qadri khairihi wa shar." So he said, "Iman or faith is that we believe in Allah, and we believe in tu'minu billahi wa malaika, and we believe the we believe in the angels, and we believe in His books, and we believe in His messengers, and we believe in the day of judgment, and we believe in 
the qadr, the khayrihi wa shar, the good of it and the bad of it. All of this makes up our iman. This is something that is wajib, this is ilm wajib, ilm durura, that all Muslims have to have. It's something that we all, it's an obligation to know, of course, the arcanal, the arcanal uh, Islam and the arcanal iman, that we should know the pillars of Islam and the pillars of iman, and we should know how to implement those pillars and how to understand them properly. And so, with this, of course, the first one he, meant, he mentioned was in tu'mina billah, and that means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So does that just mean we believe in wujudillah? That we, we just believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists? Of course not. As Muslims, it is an obligation that we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was mentioned in kitab wa sunnah, as was mentioned in the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we know that we must, if we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have correct belief, it's not simply enough, simple enough for us to have tawheed al-rububiyyah and just knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbil Alameen or that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is al-khaliq or al-raziq. That's not sufficient because the Christians believe in that. And even the Hindus believe in that to a degree, a greater extent or less. So we must know in all the aspects of Tawheed when it comes to mentioning that arkan, those pillars of faith. And also another hadith which illustrates the Iman or the definition of Iman is the hadith uh, of Abi uh, Qilada. An Abi Qilada an rajalin min ahl sham an abihi an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala lahu aslam taslam qala wa ma al islam qal in uh, an yusallim qalbika lillah wa yusallim al muslimun min lisanika wa yadik qala fa ay al islam afdal qala iman qala wa ma al iman an tu'mina billah uh, qal an tu'mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa bil ba'th qala fa ay al iman afdal qala al hijra qala wa ma al hijra qal an tu hajir su so in this hadith of abi qilada radiyallahu anhu where he mentioned he narrated a hadith on his father that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to a man he said Become Muslim or Aslam for Taslam or Aslam Taslam. That if you submit your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becoming a Muslim, that you will have a type of peacefulness and that you will have a type of uh, hadu in your heart, that your heart will be comforted. So then the man said, And what is Islam? So he wanted to know what is what the meaning of Islam is. The Prophet ﷺ answered and said that it is to that the person's heart should be made peaceful and comforted and should be in a state of humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Your heart will find comfort. The stronger your iman is, the heart your heart will find comfort. Okay, if we make our, our ibadah strictly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we humble ourselves, then we'll find comfort in that. In iman there's comfort. So then the Prophet sallallahu said, and that the Muslims should be safe from you, from your hands. That the Muslims should be safe from you, safe from your hands and your tongue. Meaning that you don't speak ill language against the Muslims. You don't curse the Muslims. You don't slander your brothers and sisters in Islam. And matter of fact, you shouldn't slander anyone. It's not permissible to backbite anyone except under special conditions, which is outside of the uh, topic of our lecture. But it is important for us to know that this is what the Prophet ﷺ defined as Islam in this particular hadith. Then he said, and what is Islam? Or what kind of Islam is better? What is the best kind of Islam? The Prophet ﷺ responded, he said, Al-Iman. So then the man asked, and what is Iman? The Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His angels 
and and his books and his messengers and the day of judgment. Then the man asked, and which type of iman is best? The Prophet ﷺ responded, he said, Hijra, making Hijra. And Hijra, it has several different meanings in the Shara. In the Sharia, Hijra has different meanings. One of the meanings is to, to leave the land of disbelief to the land of belief. To leave and migrate from the land of disbelief to the land of belief. Or to migrate from the land of bid'ah to the land of sunnah. Also, but in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hijra that he said, that hijra, it is that you leave your evil actions. That you leave evil. This was the hijra. So this shows that this is a type of iman, or this is a part of iman. And the important, this leads up to the next point, is that iman according to Ahlul Sunnah, is that iman is pronounced on our tongues, and it's in our hearts, and it is on our limbs or our outside actions. Iman is not simply in the heart. So this is a very important thing that we have to know as Muslims, because many Muslims have fallen into this as one of the early sects in Islam called the Murjia, they used to believe that Iman stays the same always. That even if you commit zina, you drink alcohol, you do all kind of evil deeds, your Iman stays the same. But this is a mistake. This is not the Iman that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. And this is not the Iman that the Sahaba, this is not how the, the Sahaba understood the Iman. The way they understood the Iman was that it is on our tongues, and that it is in our heart, and that it is also on our limbs. So meaning, even if you grow your beard for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is a part of iman, this is an action of khair. If you come to the masjid, this is an action of khair. So that shows us uh, iman is amal. It has uh, actions. Also, if you have in your niya to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in some action of ibadah, then this is a, also a type of uh, ibadah qalbiya. So this shows in the heart. This shows that this is a part of Iman as well. And if you, for example, you speak the Shahada, of course, which is on our tongue, we have to, when a person enters the fold of Islam, they say the Shahada. And that means they say the Shahada. It's with the tongue. So this shows that Iman is also on the tongue, and we'll find, we have some other evidence from the Prophet ﷺ which will illustrate that. And this... This can be evidenced in the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. Radiyallahu anhu. قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من راى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيد فان لم يستطع فبلسانه فان لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك ادعف الايمان. In this hadith that was collected in Muslim on Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu. He said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that when one of you sees a munkar, when one of you sees something haram, something that is evil, then he should change it with his hands. If he is unable to do so, he should change it with his tongue. And if he is then, if he's still unable to do so, he should change it with his heart, meaning he should hate it in his heart. And, that, and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and that is the weakest of faith. That's the weakest form of iman, is that you hate it in your heart. So sometimes we see a munkar, sometimes we see something evil taking place, but we don't have the physical force to, to, to uh, stop it. Or we see that there's going to be a greater mafsada, there's going to be a greater harm by trying to change that munkar. For example, maybe you see your Muslim brother or sister perhaps smoking a cigarette in front of the masjid. And you want to change that munkar, but you feel a little bit, uh, if you grab the cigarette from them and throw it on the ground, that they may feel this is too harsh, this may cause more harm. Maybe they will fight you and then there will be a fight in front of the masjid. And the, the non-Muslims will see this bad behavior, and the other Muslims will see that the Muslims have bad behavior. So in this case, the mafsada would be greater than the uh, uh, than the maslaha, than the 
the benefit. The harm would be greater than the benefit, in, uh, would, would overweigh the benefit. So in that case, you would not want to do that action. So because of that, then you go to the next step in Iman. You could go to that person and approach them and say, and tell them, hey, Akhi, you know, this is wrong. You know, you tell your brother or sister that this is wrong and this is not from Islam. But maybe this, maybe you see that there's going to be some harm in this as well. That it's going to be too great of a harm. Or maybe you didn't have the opportunity to, to speak to them. So the weakest form of faith is that you, you at least hate it in your heart. Maybe you didn't speak to them about it, but at least you detested it. At least you didn't say, yeah, that's good, man. I want to get a cigarette too. No. That would be, that would be uh, you know, uh, something that is actually not aiding them, but this would be a bad thing. But instead, you should at least hate that munkar in your heart. You should dislike what you saw taking place. The shahid or the point here is that iman has different maratib. Iman has different levels. And the first one we mentioned, that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, was that iman is from the hand, that it's on our limbs, it's an outward action. And the second maratib is that we speak about it, you know, that iman is also on the tongue. And that also the third uh, thing is that iman is in the heart. So all of those things make up iman, and it's incredibly important for us as Muslims to know and understand that, as many Muslims do not understand that. And I'll give you an example for that. Is that a lot of times we see our brothers and sisters doing something. Maybe they're doing something that's haram. Or maybe they're doing something that at least is not a good thing. And we say to them, you, you try to advise them in a nice way. And they say, hey, you don't, know my, you don't know my heart. You don't know my heart. You know, in my heart I have iman, I'm good. But that's not correct because... We know as, as, as it's illustrated from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, is that Iman is all of those things. So if the heart is clean, the limbs, uh, the limbs will bear witness to that. The limbs will be clean too. Meaning that when a person's heart is really clean, truly on Iman, then you will see the effects on their limbs. You know, the person who has very strong uh, Iman, no matter what he looks like, he should have good manners. You should see some, some sort of action, some thamarat al-ilm. You should see some fruits of his knowledge or some fruits of his iman and his faith. And we'll get to that some hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that illustrate that very well. In another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, he said, Al-iman bid'un wa sab'un shu'bah. A'laha qawl la ilaha illallah wa adnaha imatata adha an tariq. So the Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith, he said that belief or iman has 70 branches. He said that the highest branch of iman is, the sta- is saying la ilaha illallah. This is the highest level according to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said the lowest level is that you take something harmful from the path of the people. So when people are driving their car, maybe there's something harmful in the street. If you stop your car and can pull it over safely and just remove that harm in the in the in the path of the people, then this will be you will get edger for this. If you especially if you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows us what do we get from this hadith? Is that iman is what? It's on the tongue and it's on the limbs. Because he said, Al Qaul La ilaha illallah. Al Qaul is what? Al Qaul is the saying. So that means on the tongue. And then he said, Adna imatata adha an tariq. He said the lowest branch is taking a harmful thing from the, from the street or taking a, a, a harmful thing from the path of the people. When you take something from the path, this is physical. This is a physical thing. So this shows us what? That iman is on the limbs and it's in the heart and it's on the tongue. Also, according to Ahl Sunnah, that iman fluctuates as well as disbelief. Uh, yeah, I mean, iman fluctuates. It has different. It fluctuates. Also, iman has different levels. What I mean by fluctuating is iman. It's not always constant. Like the the early sect I said, the murjia, like they believe that iman always stays the same. But iman is not like that. Iman fluctuates. So the more you do uh, good for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala the more your iman goes up. This increases your iman. Yazid bi ta'a wa yanqus bi ma'asiyah. And iman, it increases with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it goes 
down and, and lessens or lowers with sinfulness. And all of us can, can, you know, all of us, as we mentioned before, according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we all commit sins. So all of us know, whenever you, the sin becomes, you know, all of us commit sins, so sometimes if you feel those sins, you see how it t takes you, it lowers your iman. Whenever you do sin, it lowers your iman. If you do something you know wasn't correct, that makes you feel worse. If, you, if your iman has some sort of strength to it, you're going to feel the effects. And I'll give you a good uh, an example for those people who come to the masjid especially. Say if the person watches videos at night, they watch movies or whatever. And so they watch these movies till the late hours of the night. And then they sleep and they don't wake up for the fajr prayer. And especially if they're the people, if they're the people who come to the masjid and they miss Salat in the Masjid, they really feel empty that whole day. It's you feel, and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this in a hadith as well, that you feel as if your whole day was just destroyed. Whenever you sleep in from the Fajr prayer, if you're, you know, for those people who make the Salat regularly in the Masjid, you feel crunchy. You feel as, this, as if your whole day was just shattered from whatever you did at night that caused you to not wake up in the day. So this shows us what? That the sinfulness, it lowers the iman. Sinfulness, it lowers the iman. And as Ahl Sunnah mentions in their books, that disbelief, oppression, and all of these things, they have different levels. That there is the type of oppression that takes you out of the fold of Islam and there's the kind of oppression that you're still in the fold of Islam and there is disbelief there is disbelief uh, for the that takes you out of the fold of Islam and then there's the less lesser type of disbelief a kufr dun kufr you know where you're doing a major sin which is an act of kufr but it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam instead it nullifies those deeds that you uh, that you were doing so According to Ahlul Sunnah, is Iman has different levels. And one of the proofs for this is that Imam Bukhari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, entitled a chapter in Sahih Bukhari called, To be ungrateful to one's husband and disbelief is of different grades. So Imam Bukhari mentioned in Sahih Bukhari that, that Iman in the title of one of his chapters he said disbelief is of different grades. So this shows us that disbelief is not always, it doesn't always take you out of the fold of Islam. So someone can do a, uh, an act of even a type of kufr, the lesser kufr, and they could still be in the fold of Islam. And they might have low iman, but that doesn't take all their iman away. And that's a very important point to, uh, for us to be aware of that, as there are other groups especially like the original sect, one of the first sects in Islam called the Khawarij, and they believed in calling other Muslims non-Muslims for the major sins that they committed. So we must be very, very careful in how we treat our Muslim brothers and sisters and that we don't, make, uh, we don't call someone a kafir uh, unjustly. That's a major sin. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the person does that, who does that, the... That pronouncement of takfir or that pronouncement of kufr falls upon one of them. So be very careful, ya ikhwan, that we must be very careful on how we judge others. And leave that to the scholars, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. So in this hadith that Imam Bukhari mentioned, he said, Bab kufran, kufran al-ashir, wa kufr dun kufr. An Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu qal, qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ara'aytu nar, uh, 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 so the Prophet ﷺ said, he saw the, the hellfire, and most of the people in the hellfire were the women. And, he met, and then the person asked, you know, did they disbelieve? Dis, did they disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Prophet ﷺ basically said, no, they didn't disbelieve in Allah, but they were ungrateful to their husbands. And they, whenever, uh, they were ungrateful to their husbands whenever a favor, uh, when, when their husbands were doing many favors for them. The husband was taking care of them, but he maybe made a mistake one day. Or sometimes he makes regular mistakes. 
So this, the case the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, he said they are ungrateful to their husbands and for the favors done to them. If you were always good to one of them and she sees something to her disliking, she will say, I have never seen any good from you. So this shows us what? In this hadith, this shows us the importance of knowing that Iman has different levels and that there are different types of kufr. Even there's different types of disbelief. As Iman has different levels, disbelief has different levels. And that's why Imam Bukhari entitled that chapter, chapter in, in the last section of the entitlement, Kufr Dunu Kufr, the less the, that Kufr has different levels of, uh, has different levels basically. The, the lesser type of Kufr. <clears throat> In another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned, "Al Muslim man sallima Muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi, wal mu'min man amina hu al nas ala dimaihim wa amwalihim, wal muhajiru min man hajira siyat, wal mujahidu man jahida nafsuhu lillah." That's a very important hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned. He said, "The Muslim." is the one who the other Muslims are safe from. They're safe from him. They're safe from him, from his tongue, from him backbiting and cursing them. And they're safe from his hands, as we already mentioned, that he doesn't harm them, he doesn't beat the other Muslims, he doesn't steal from them, he, he's uh, gentle with his Muslim brothers and sisters. And then the Prophet ﷺ showed us that there are different levels. He said the Muslim. Then in the second part, he said, Well, mu'min, meaning the believer, the mu'min has another level of iman than the Muslim. The Muslim does his general uh, practices Islam, but he sometimes he falls short in the wajib deeds, in the wajibat. He, he falls short, he falls into sin like this. But the mu'min is on another level of uh, of, of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mu'min is more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, Al-mu'min man amina huwa nas ala dima'ihim wa amwalihim. The mu'min, the believer, is the one who the people are safe in their blood and in their wealth. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, and the muhajir, the person who makes hijrah, is the one who leaves his evil deeds. This is a type of hijra, and it's a very, very important type of hijra for all of us to try to do. This is a type of hijra which is a, a, a very strong form of ibadah that all of us can do. And he said, "Well, mujahid min jahid nafsuhu lillah." And he said, "The one who does jihad, the jihad he was mentioning here was the jihad and nafs." He said that the the one who does jihad <clears throat> is the one who fights or struggles against himself. That this is one of the greatest forms of jihad. That the person who, when he wants to do something muharram, he stops himself. Because our inclination is to do the muharramat. We have an incl inclination to do sinful acts, you know, as, as, as human beings. Bani Adam, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu ibn, Kulu ibn Adam khatta. He said, all the children of Adam make mistakes. So that means all of us. So all of us have an inclination to do some acts of disobedience. Of disobedience. But the mujahid is the one who stops himself. He fights that. He fights his nafs. He fights his desires for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he's rewarded greatly for struggling against himself. And another, I want to mention now, moving on to the next point in the lecture, some of the narrations which, as we mentioned before, this group, the Khawarij, the, the people who uh, declare other Muslims to be disbeliever unjustly, some of the narrations that they use as proof and how we should understand some of these hadith narrations. For example, in the hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس الأجمعين. 
والناس أجمعين. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, and none of you believes until I am more beloved to him than his children and his parents and all of mankind. In the beginning of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمنوا They don't believe, or you, the, the person who, who doesn't hold me to be more beloved, doesn't believe. The people who misunderstand this hadith, they believe that this, this uh, yanfi kamala, yanfi kamala uh, uh, iman, that this negates all of iman, but that's not the case. That's not the case and that's now not how Ahlul Sunnah understands these hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So we must know that when the Prophet ﷺ says, لا يؤمنوا, that doesn't mean ala itlaq. It doesn't mean totally that you don't believe, that you have no iman. It just means that this person has less iman. That the person with full iman would do the duty that the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning. As he mentioned in another hadith that I'm sure we're all familiar with, لا ي... قال صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه that none of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself again the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم began that hadith with لا يؤمن they don't believe or he doesn't believe so that shows us again this is not على إطلاق it's not in total, the total disbelief. So it's very important that we understood, that we understand these uh, narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, as we'll find many of them in Bukhari and Muslim and all through the books of Hadith and, and, and so forth, that we understand that these nusus or these evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah, how we have to understand them in their proper context and understand them how the mufassirin, how the people of tafsir, how they understood them, how Ahlul Sunnah understood them, and how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ understood them. And in another hadith, which is also one that they use to declare other Muslims to be disbelievers, وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا يَزْنِي زَانِي وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ That the person who commits zina doesn't commit that act of zina while he is a believer. So we must understand this hadith as the people, Ahlul Hadith understood this hadith. So, لا يزني زاني وهو مؤمن That does not, which means that the person does not commit, the believer does not commit a zina or adultery and remain a believer. Again, this nasus or this uh, text is not ala itlaq. It is. It doesn't negate iman totally. So the one ahl sunnah has the understanding and the belief that the one who does a sin, even the major sins, they're still a believer. They're still a, a, a Muslim. This doesn't take away their their iman totally. But instead, this makes the iman less. It makes our iman less. Al iman it goes up with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it lessens with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the benefits we get from this, uh, these hadith is these hadith they illustrate that the seriousness of uh, the punishments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in staying away from these sins by loving for your brother what you love for yourself by staying away from zina and staying away from those things that the Prophet sallallahu warned us to stay away from. So this illustrates that those actions are serious when the Prophet sallallahu Let's us know that this is something la yu'min, that they don't believe or that it takes away from your iman. And another thing we gain from this hadith is that it encourages obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those actions that were mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, another benefit we gain from this hadith is that this goes against the belief of the Khawarij and those groups which make takfir of the Muslims for without rightfully doing so. So we, now we understand those nusus, those texts, in accordance to the way Ahl Hadith and Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah understand these nusus, how they understand these texts. And that these nusus agree with Ahl Sunnah. I want to read a statement of Imam Nawawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who is one of our classical scholars, and I'm sure all of us read Riyadh Salihin, uh, Arbaeen Nawawi, you know, the 40 Hadith of Imam Nawawi, 
These are just some of the books that he did. And he died as a very young man. I believe, if I recall right, he might have only been like 40 years old, subhanAllah. And look what he left for us as a khidmah for the ummah of Muhammad wasallam, and in protecting the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So Imam Noah, we said, in regards to those, those narrations that give us a threat of punishment, but they don't actually take away our iman in totality. He said, according to the statement of Allah, the glorified and exalted. So he mentions the, the ayat, in Allah la yaghfir an yushrik bihi wa yaghfir ma duna dhalik liman yasha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily Allah does not forgive that partners are associated with him, but he forgives other than that from whom he pleases. Imam know what we said about this. He said, in accordance with the consensus of the people of truth, meaning the scholars, the fornicator, the thief, and the murderer, and anyone who commits major sins except shirk, are not expelled from the religion due to sin they have committed. And of course, unless this means, unless someone does kufr, something that takes them out of the fold of Islam, you know, ma'lum min adin bi durura, something like example, if someone stepped on the Quran intentionally, or they did something you know, that takes you out of the fold of Islam, of course, they have left the fold of Islam without, without doubt. But for the major sins, as he mentioned, the scholars were, have consensus that if a major sinner is not out the fold of Islam. So that means what? His iman goes down, but his iman is, does not, is not take him out of the fold of Islam. He's still a Muslim. And he still has rights of you as your Muslim uh, brother and sister. Then Imam Noah said, rather, they are believers who have deficiency in faith. If they repent, their punishment is remitted. And if they continue in their sin until death, then they are at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah the Almighty wishes, He will pardon them and they will enter paradise first. And if He wants, He will punish them, then admit them to paradise. So that's important for us to understand those nasus, those uh, texts related to uh, the wa'id, al-wa'id wa wa'id or you know, relating to the punishments. Because the pillars of Iman are from the foundation of the religion and the creed of the scholars uh, and creed, the scholars say that it is not possible to believe in one pillar and leave off some pillars. So it's wajib, it's an obligation upon us to believe in all the pillars of Iman as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. Uh, you know, as he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the pillars in the Quran as we mentioned the ayat before and as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in like the hadith of Jibreel and other than this that those six pillars of Iman that if you believe in some of them and you don't believe in others, this person is a kafir, this person is not a, a Muslim. The person who only believes in some of the pillars of Iman, he's not a Muslim. It's an obligation to, to know all those pillars, to believe in all of them. We must believe in Allah, of course, and believe in Him correctly. We must believe in the Prophet wasallam, all the prophets and messengers. We must believe in the Quran and all the books. <clears throat> we must believe that they're a malaika. We've never seen them, but we believe in them. We must believe in the day of judgment, Yom Al-Qiyamah. We must believe in the uh, Qadr, the divine destiny, the Khair and the Shar of it. That's wajib. So if you don't believe in one of those, this person is not a Muslim. Okay? So it's very important to have correct belief and correct Aqidah. Iman requires us to strive in order to increase our Iman. Iman's not going to just increase by itself. We must do actions. So I want to, uh, before our time runs out, I just want to mention some of the ways that we can increase our iman. Uh, one of our ulama, Sheikh Abd Razak Al Badr, half of Allah Taala, he said, "Fala al insan wa saadatuhu fi dunya wal akhirah martabatun bil iman." He said, "The happiness of a person." In this life and the hereafter is related to a person's iman. The person whose iman is high, think about it. Even in the case of poverty, when you go to many Muslim countries even, you see that you know, many Muslim countries, many, the Muslim, most of the Muslim countries are part of the third world. They're very poor countries. There are some wealthy ones in the Gulf, those few exceptions, uh, the Sultanate of Brunei and other places that have, have wealth. But many of the Muslim countries, they are poor countries. But what you find, you don't find the sins to the same level as you find in a non-Muslim country. Because of the qalb. We have sins, yes. But if you go, to example, to the Muslims in a poor country, 
and the non-Muslims in that poor country, you'll find that usually the non-Muslims are doing way more sins. Because they don't, and they, they don't have that kind of happiness. But the Muslim, he's even poor, but he's still just happy just to have some Iman. Because the Iman helps him to deal with the Qadr. With Qadr is part of Iman. It helps him to deal with the divine destiny. He doesn't have money. So instead of being like the non-Muslim who may go out and steal and rob and kill for the money, the believer, even though he doesn't have that money, he's still going to deal with it. He's going to say, Qadr Allah wa ma I'm still going to strive to get my money another way. I'm going to try to be patient. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has another path for me. So this is the characteristic of the believer. And this is where we see that the iman helps you cope and have happiness in this dunya wal akhirah. It is an obligation upon us to supervise ourselves and constantly judge ourselves. And it's not sufficient to just hope for, hope for faith or hope that our faith will increase. Again, we have to do deeds. Uh, we have to strive. Uh, and if a person claims, as we mentioned before, they claim they have a clean heart, but yet they have disbelief, they have correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you usually see signs of it manifested on their limbs and in their manners. So again, we have to work towards uh, increasing our iman. Some of the reasons our iman increases. I took this from the lecture of the Shaykh. Hafizullah Ta'ala, Shaykh Abdul Razak, and some of the, the thing, he mentioned three things specifically that help us to, or that are reasons to increase our faith. And the first one, which is incredibly important, and he says this is A'zam, that this is the greatest one to help you increase your faith. So all of us need this. He said, knowledge, teaching the knowledge, and striving to learn, striving to gain knowledge. This is one of the most important things you can do to increase your iman. And we're going to get to the reasons why. قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Is the one who knows, you know, who has ilm, who has knowledge similar to the person who has no knowledge? Are they the same? La abidin. They're not the same. The person who has knowledge, who's gaining more knowledge of their religion, they are a law, they have a, a higher station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person, and so if we strive to learn more about our religion, even mashallah, jazakum Allah khairan, we have this, uh, duksiga Quranka. Okay, so we have this markas al Quran here. And we have the children coming here. Well, this is encouraging the children to gain al nafiyah. This is encouraging the children to learn about their Islam. And that's incredibly important. Those parents who have sacrificed their wealth and their time and so forth to let their children do this, then they are receiving ajr from this. And their children will know more about Islam and help carry Islam after we. Uh, depart from this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qala fi kitabi al-kareem innama yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-ulama that, Allah, that the people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most are the scholars. They're the people who have knowledge. So the more knowledge that we have the more we will have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we'll have more taqwa. And we'll have more iman because all of those things are related. The taqwa, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our iman. So the more a person knows and practices, not just knowing, there are many people who have memorized the Qur'an and memorized hadith, but they're committing the major sins. Or you see a person, he's mashallah, he's big shaykh, this and that and the other people, the people say he's a big shaykh and this and that and the other, but you see he treats the people very bad, very bad manners. Or you see him doing this and doing that. So that shows there's a naqs in his iman. And that might point to a naqs or a, a lessening even in his knowledge. Because the ulama, the salaf used to say that al-amal thamarat al-ilm that good deeds are the fruits of knowledge. The fruit of our knowledge is doing good deeds. The more we have knowledge and we practice that knowledge, then the more our iman is going to go up and that shows that's a sign of iman. But if you just carry the Qur'an or you just carry the sunnah, meaning you're not practicing it, then that will actually bear witness on you on the day of judgment. A'udhu billah min dhalik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises those people who believe, meaning they have iman, and who He has given knowledge. The people of knowledge, the scholars, you see this. Especially if you get a chance to travel and you see some of the scholars in some of the Muslim lands. I mean, you know, mashallah, we have a lot of major scholars in many places like Saudi Arabia and Yemen and probably in villages in Somalia and probably in, in many different countries in Egypt, all over. Ahl Sunnah Mawjood. Ahl Sunnah Mawjood fi kulli makan. You'll find people of Ahl Sunnah everywhere. And Ahl Hadith, you'll find them, mashallah, you can go to Morocco, you can go to Mauritania, and you'll find at least, you might find people who are also deviant, but you'll also find someone from Ahl Sunnah who's calling to Kitabillah wa Sunnah to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, Allah raises them. Allah raises them darajat. Allah raises the people of knowledge. He increases them. He increases them in khair in the dunya and in the akhirah. And the Prophet ﷺ also related to this, uh, the important, the, one of the first reasons which we said is seeking the knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ سَلَقَ تَرِيكٍ يَلْتَمِسُهُ بِهِ عَلْمٍ سَحَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ تَرِيكٍ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever traverses the path of knowledge, whoever seeks knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the path of Jannah easy for him. So by seeking knowledge, just by coming to the Mahadra, mashallah, that you guys come to every, uh, I think there's a Mahadra here every Saturday and Sunday, the Shaykh gives tafsir, mashallah, tabarakallah. By coming to that with the sole intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the path of Jannah easier for you. Because you could be out wasting time at Blockburst video, you could be on the internet, you could be doing this, you could be doing this, you could be doing this, but those things will help us. That will help us in the dunya wal akhirah. That will help raise our community. That will help raise us uh, in, in every respect. Because as we see the Muslims, we're in a, a, a weaker state right now. And we see how much the Christians sacrifice. Look at how they sacrifice their wealth and their time to do dawah. Dawah al shaitan. That's what they do. But the Muslim, ala kitab sunnah, if we can invest in our children so they gain the knowledge and they can go out and we can make Seattle have Marrakesh a sunnah, and we can make Ethiopia have Marrakesh a sunnah, and we can establish Marrakesh a sunnah in, in, in Somalia, we can establish in Indonesia, we can establish all over the place, then this is how the ummah will be raised up. And that's how it not only increases your iman, it increases the whole ummah. Because that's the only way right now with our weakness that we will get out of the state that we're in is by increasing our iman by ilm sahih, ilm nafia, by correct knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ also said in relation to the importance of seeking the knowledge, he said, مَن يُرِدَ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينَ He said, whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them understanding of the religion. So all of these things, they show us that the path to Jannah, one of the paths is knowledge, is correct knowledge of Kitab wa Sunnah. Also, that we, that the person who has knowledge, that they will see things, they will see Jannah very real and serious, and they will see the hellfires really serious. And so then they will be remembered, because if they're reciting those hadith and practicing those hadith, then they will become more fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I said, he said, مَنْ يُرِدُ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفِقُهُ فِي الدِّينَ So we'll go to the, the next thing that the Shaykh mentioned as a way to increase our iman, because I don't want to get too close to the time for salat so we can prepare for salat. The second thing the Shaykh said was that by reading and understanding and contemplating the Qur'an, تَدَبْرَ Quran. The more that we gain knowledge of the Qur'an by memorizing and understanding its meaning, this will have an effect on our heart and will understand the meaning and it will help you in your practice. This will help you in your iman. The more we read the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, it makes Islam more real for us. But if we don't read Qur'an well as sunnah, then we walk around the earth and we, our hearts become dead and it be, seems like it's just something, something far away. You know, as Allah mentions all throughout the Qur'an, that the people of Jahiliyyah, that they will say, those are the tales of the ancients when they mention the Qur'an. 
You know, those are the tales of Ajdadina. Those are the tales of the people before. But if we read, then it becomes real for us. The more we read those hadith, and we read the Qur'an, and we uh, think about the Qur'an, then and reflect on the Qur'an, then it will increase our iman. And the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The Prophet ﷺ said, that the best of you is the person who studies the Qur'an and teaches it. So mashallah, tabarakallah, those hufaz amongst us, those people who have memorized the Qur'an and are teaching the children and teaching the adults and teaching different people, they are doing one of the, they are some of the best of people. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. Khayrukum. He said the best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. Because that's how we uh, retain and hold the religion. That's how we increase our iman. That's how we increase our ibadah. That's how we uh, will become those people who are on ilm and thiq wa basira. We'll be of those people who are have knowledge and they have thiq, they have understanding of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third thing that the shaykh mentioned, he said that reflecting on the life you know, reflecting on the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, reflecting on the biography of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and his sunnah. And so, in this regard, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnata khulafa Rashidin al Mahdiin, adu alayha bi nawadij, wa iyyakum wa muhtathar al amur, fa inna kulla bidatin dalala." The Prophet ﷺ said, "And it is upon you my sunnah. You know, it's my way, my legislated way." And the way of my, the 44 rightly guided uh, khalifs, meaning Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, and all the sahaba. So by following the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, we will have, of course, foes or uh, success in this life as well as the hereafter. And this will what? Increase our iman. Of course, we can only get that success by having our iman strong. You know, a, a disbeliever cannot, does not have any iman. So make sure you understand that, that a disbeliever, even if he believes in some of the pillars of Islam, he likes some things about Islam, but the fact that he's a disbeliever, he has no iman. The Muslim is the only one who can have iman. And, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, If tarakat al-Yahud ala ithi wa sab'ayin firqa, wa if tarakat al-Nasara ala ithi natayin wa sab'ayin firqa, wa sa taftariku hadhi umma ala thalatha wa sab'ayin firqa, kulha fin nar ala wahida, kulna man hiya ya Rasulullah, kala man kana ala mithli wa ma kana alayhi wa ashabi. O kama kala Nabi ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ said, The Jews broke into 70 sects, and the Christians broke into 71 sects, and my umma will break into 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. And they said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ answered, those who are on my sunnah and the way of my, uh, my companions. So again, this encourages us what? To follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is how we can increase our iman. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ragiba an sunnati falaysa minni. And this is very important. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever rejects my sunnah, then he is not from me. And this hadith was mentioned uh, in conjunction to the people, to three people. They were doing great ibadah. There was a woman, she was tying herself up, tying her arms to like a post to stay up for tahajid. She was so, she just wanted, this is how in the time of the sahaba, how they were about ibadah. We, we're just, we just sleep, we don't care. But they were so serious about going to Jannah, you know. And so she thinking that this was a good way, she used to tie her arms and her limbs so that when she began to fall asleep in tahajid, she would be like hanging up so that would, you know, that pain would keep her awake. Okay? And then there was the man, one of the men who said, you know, he said, I'm going to fast all the time. Every day, I'm not even going to break my fast. And another one, he said, I'm not ever going to marry. You know, I'm never going to marry. Khalas, because I'm just going to devote myself to worship. And this is as you see the priests do. But look at the, look at even the sunnah law with this. Look at the priests. How many priests in the past 20, uh, 10 years has it come to light? It's been all in the news. 
churches in every country that have the Catholic Church because of these priests say, no, we're, we're married to Jesus or we're married to God or whatever they say. And they don't marry and then they do some of the filthiest deeds. You know, they, they do the, the evil faisha. And why? Because they tajawaz al-had. They go beyond the bounds. And so the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith, he was mentioning this and warning the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ not to go beyond the bounds. Because he said, مَنْ رَغَبَ أَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ minni." Because he heard that these people were doing this. He says, I'm the Prophet ﷺ and I marry women and I fast and I break my fast and I uh, you know, take a break, I sleep in the night and make tahajjud. So the Prophet you know, has the middle course. This is the course of the believers. Not to go to one extreme and say, oh yeah, this is a way of ibadah. Because we know the two conditions to have all of our deeds accepted are what? First and foremost, ikhlas lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> that we do whatever act of worship we're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second condition is what? Is that it's in conjunction with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So the person, he comes into the masjid, he says, I'm going to pray, you know, I'm going to be tired in the morning, I'm going to pray fajr in the time of Isha. And his niyyah is solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will his deed be accepted? Absolutely not. Why? Because he didn't follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Because both of those conditions were not met. And so, this is very important for us that we understand that. And then in another hadith, and I'll uh, end with that because I think our time is, is, is going up very soon. The Prophet wasallam said also in this regard, in regards to following his sunnah, he said, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فُهُ رَدْ And وَفِي رَوَائِ فِي مُسْلَمْ مَنْ أَمَلَ أَمَنًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرِنَا فُهُ رَدْ So the Prophet wasallam said, whoever does something which is not in accordance with my sunnah basically, in accordance with our affairs, then it will be rejected. So that means no matter how much we, we think we're doing an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's not, and, you, and they might even be sincere, but it's going against the sunnah, then it's not accepted. That act is not accepted. It doesn't mean all their deeds are not accepted, no. But it means, for who rad, it's talking about the deed that they committed the bid'ah, they committed the innovation for. For example, as we see many of the Muslims and people yantasib al-Islam, that they go to the graves and they say, Ya Bedawi, Ya Fulan. I know they do that in Somalia. I know they do it in Ethiopia. I know they do it, Ya Tijani, Ya Fulan. They go and they are sincere. A lot of times those people, use, they will cry and they'll sacrifice a goat on top of that grave. But all of this is shirk. This is shirk. So they were trying to do ibadah with shirk. So that, that totally negates tawheed aslan. Not just iman, but as, the asl of tawheed. So this is why it's very important for us to know and have the correct knowledge and come closer to Allah by what? By having ikhlas and following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I'll end with one last hadith related to the topic. So how should we protect ourselves? How should we protect ourselves in our iman? Basically, this answer comes with ijtinab al-muharram. You know, staying away from the muharramat. Doing our best to do good deeds and stay away from the evil deeds. As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, ijtinabu uh, saba mubiqat. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, stay away from the seven deadly sins. And the first sin he mentioned was shirk billah. It's having shirk. That's the most deadliest thing. So that's why in order to have, to not fall into shirk, we have to do what? We have to have correct tawheed. And how do we have correct tawheed? We have to ta'allam. We have to study. We have to know what the difference between shirk is and tawheed. What sunnah and bid'ah is. What kufr is and what iman is. We have to know those differences and that only comes through learning. So, in the last hadith that I'm mentioning, an Nu'man ibn Bashir qala sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul in al-halal bayyan wa in al-haram bayyan wa baynahum mushtabihat la ya'lamu la ya'lamu hunna kathir min an-nas fa man attaqa shubahat istabarra li dinihi wa irdihi wa man waqa'a fi shubahat waqa'a fi al-haram kir-ra'i hawla al-himma yushik an yarta'a fi 
ألا وإن لكل ملك هم ألا وإن هم الله محرمه ألا وإن في جزد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح جزد كله وإذا فسد فسد جزد كله ألا وهي القلب the Prophet sallallahu said in this hadith that was related by Nu'man ibn Mashir radiallahu anhu who said he heard the Prophet sallallahu say that the halal is clear and the haram is clear. And between them are some doubtful matters. And many, and, uh, and so whoever, and, and in those doubtful matters, many people fall into the doubt, doubtful matters. And the person who stays away from the doubtful matters, meaning the things that we don't know for sure if it's haram or if it's halal or not, then this person is safe in his religion. They're safe with his, his honor and his religion. But the person who says, well, it's not haram, let me, let me do it, but I know it might be makru, I heard it was makru, I heard it's disliked, and they do that, this person will come closer to the haram until he falls into it. And that's the shahid of the hadith. And in the last part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, he said, وَإِنَّ فِي جِزِدِ مُضْغَةٍ إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ جِزِدَ كُلُّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَ فَسَدَ جِزِدَ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبُ So the Prophet ﷺ said, that in the body is an organ, that if it is protected and, and, and in good condition, the whole body will be in good condition. And he said, if it is uh, spoiled, or it is ruined, or it is dirty, then the whole body will be dirty. And then he said, and it is the heart. Meaning, this goes to the shah, this is the shahid. This is the point, the main point, is relating back to our lecture, which was about iman and how we can increase it, is that when our hearts, by having our iman weak, and doing muharramat, it will be reflected in our actions as well. Because Iman is what? Iman is in the heart, Iman is on the tongue, and Iman is on the limbs. It is all those things. So by protecting our heart, we protect our limbs. And the heart is the most important thing. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with clean hearts and Iman. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise up the Muslimin fi kulli makan. And forgive us for all our sins. Asal Allah Kareem, Rabbil Arsh al Adim, and Yatawalana Fiduni Walakhara. Wasallallahu wa sallam ala Nabi and Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa sallam.